Greetings from the Lairdall booth at the National Patient Safety Foundation Congress at the JW Marriott in Austin, Texas. We're surrounded by a host of people here, over a thousand attendees representing hospitals from across the country, members of continuous quality improvement, risk management, chief medical officers, chief nursing officers, all here to talk about patient safety. We're joined right now by Rick Stone. Rick Stone is the chief innovation officer for Sinensis. So greetings, Rick. Good. Glad to have you here. Glad to glad, be here. Glad your plane arrived yes. and your taxi arrived yes, on time. That's right. You know, yeah. It's a little stressful getting over yeah, here. That's right. But I'm here. So yes, thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about Sinensis. Well, um, for probably the last 30 years almost, I've been working with storytelling as a an approach for transformation okay. and have done a lot of things with that, I've written about it, we've created a product that's keyed into using stories in a powerful way. Um, and, um, and since joining Sinensis, uh, I've known the Sinensis group for a long time, worked collaboratively with them for a number of years and uh, joined them almost two years ago. And uh, our organization is focused on one thing very simply, which is helping hospitals reduce preventable harm. Our perspective is that that's uh, primarily rooted in, um, in human factors, in sure. poor teamwork, poor communication, in culture, in leadership. And uh, those are the things that if they're not really addressed, uh, all the process improvement that you would, you would entertain and engage with won't get you to where you really want to go. So we help organizations understand those issues better and actually uh, work on them and actually improve uh, with approaches that we bring to them. Now, your specialty is the use of narrative That's correct. To, uh, to address human factors, which is really quite interesting. It's very unique, um, but not something that's terribly new. So could you tell us a little well, bit about Well, it's these? maybe 10 or 20,000 years old. Yeah, there you so, go. you know, uh, people have been telling stories for a long time. And uh, early in my career, I had an opportunity to work with a woman named Paula Underwood, who's Native American. And, um, and she came from a tradition of stories. And they understood that storytelling was, was crucial to their survival. So, but there is, there is a science as well as an art to storytelling. Sure. And so that's been my focus over the last few years is how do we in a very purposeful way create narratives that engage people? And you know what's interesting, we often think, oh, that was a very powerful story. It may often be not that the story that we tell is the important story, it's the other stories that are running in our mind that get um, catalyzed or sparked by the story people hear. Right. So that's where real learning happens, is when, uh, almost like uh, popcorn going off, when we hear a story, it connects us to other experiences we've had and we're suddenly able to weave together and see new perspectives that we might not have seen before. So stories can be powerful learning tools in sure. themselves, but their real power often resides in what they can actually instigate in us, is that they can connect us to what we may not even know that we know. So that's the power of story. So in, a, in just a minute, we're going to listen to a story, but before we do, um, I'd like you to comment, because you work with hospitals from across the country, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge to improving patient safety in healthcare today? I think it comes down to one fundamental issue is that hospitals are not learning organizations yet. There's okay. not a, an appreciation for the importance of learning. And, uh, there's a notion that, well, all of our people, they went off and they had all their professional education, so they should be experts and they should all be able to know what they're doing. Sure. And um, that sort of flies in the face of everything we know about successful, high reliable organizations in other, set, in other uh, industries, is that those organizations that are highly reliable, that have very, very small rates of harm, are continually focused on learning. And if you don't bring that into the culture of hospitals, we will continue to have very high levels of harm. And all the wonderful work that's being done here at this conference uh, will be for naught, actually, unless we can actually change the culture of hospitals and turn them into learning organizations where there's a commitment from the leadership down to continual learning. Sure. And I think that once, once we get there, we'll not have a problem. But until we get there, we're going to continue to see really high levels of harm. Right. 
Well, we're lucky to have some of those hospitals that have become learning organizations That's right. here. There are some real yeah. pioneers, and, and they're represented here at this conference this week. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little unique. Uh, we're going to listen to a story. I think that's a great um, idea. We're going to play a story, a story that has to do with preparedness in the emergency room. And uh, then you and I, once we've listened to that story and once our listening audience has listened to that story, we're going to debrief. Sounds we're like we're going to talk about the, yeah. what impact that story can really have. Yeah, it's a great story, so it's a good one to share with our audience. Great. It was 1.47 a.m. and Dr. Jack Singer sat bolt upright from a deep sleep. The phone had now rung four times. He peered at the alarm clock, then reached over and picked up the receiver. Jack Singer here. Jack, it's Faye Hobbs. He knew Faye well, having worked closely with her. She was the ED attending. What is it, Faye? He asked as his head cleared and he swung his legs over the edge of the bed. Calls at this hour usually meant one thing and one thing only. We've got a patient who was brought in about 45 minutes ago, female, around 55. Apparently she woke up with severe headache after which she lost consciousness and was brought in by her husband. Our radiology resident called me a couple minutes ago to relate that the CAT scan showed subarachnoid hemorrhage consistent with a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. Lifelight was called for a transfer and she's been intubated. Vitals are stable and pupils are midpoint sluggish. The problem is that the lifelike crew got here a couple minutes ago and was getting her ready for the transfer when her blood pressure spiked and her heart rate dropped into the 40s. That's why I'm calling. Jack Singer was now fully awake and had made his way into the office adjacent to his bedroom and had already clicked his computer's mouse. It came alive and in a few clicks he was into the hospital's electronic records. As he was pulling up the record, he asked, Is there hydrocephalus on the CAT scan? Faye's tone said it all. Frankly, I'm not convinced our radiology resident got the read right. That's why I think we need you here, Stad. One look at the CAT scan and Jack Singer was heading to the closet, peeling off his pajamas and getting on a pair of pants. On my way, have a ventriculostomy kit ready at her bedside. Moments later, he was in his car hitting speeds of 90 miles per hour. He prayed there were no police out at this late hour. Three minutes out, his cell rang. It was Faye Hobbs again with desperation in her voice. Where are you? I'll be there in just a minute. The car had barely turned off as he slammed the door and ran toward the ED. There was a beehive of activity surrounding the patient, lying on the life flight stretcher. He quickly scrubbed and slipped on gloves and a mask. Dr. Hobbs was waiting as well, scrubbed and prepared to assist. That's when he looked down at the prep tray where the kit was open and waiting and quickly scanned for everything he needed to perform the procedure. This particular kit was different than the one he customarily used, and he recognized immediately that it doesn't come with a ventricular catheter. Faye, this kit has no ventricular catheter. Get it or get me a Gahar guide kit, now, please. She nodded her head and ran from the room. He turned and picked up the clipper to shave the patient's head. It hadn't been charged. Jack stared down in disbelief and shouted out, these clippers are dead, somebody get me another one, stat. Two of the nurses standing nearby ran out of the room in search of another clipper. A moment later, one of them came back breathless and handed it to him. He hit the switch. It was dead, too. Jack yelled out, forget the clippers, just get me a razor. She went running, and he could hear her yelling to her colleagues, where do we keep the razors? A minute ticked off, then two. Dr. Singer began pacing. At three minutes, he stuck his head out of the room. What's going on out here? Where's my ventricular catheter and razor? Faye Hobbs stuck her head in the door with a look of abject terror in her eyes. We can't find either. Dr. Singer was incredulous. What? Just give me another minute. They have to be here somewhere, she pleaded. My patient is in here dying and we don't have another minute. He returned to the patient's side and looked over at the life flight crew who were standing off to the side fidgeting. The look on their faces said it all. A moment later, one of the nurses rushed in with a razor, and with great difficulty, Dr. Singer shaved the patient's head. Another nurse came rushing in with another ventriculostomy kit, but it was the same brand as the one sitting on the tray. No ventricular catheter. Get Jane Smithers and OR on the phone now, he shouted out. A nurse picked up the phone on the wall, dialed the extension, and handed it to Dr. Singer. It seemed to ring forever before Jane Smithers picked up. Jane, it's Jack Singer down here in the ED. We need a ventricular catheter stat. Surely you have one of them up there. Jane was matter of fact. Dr. Singer would love to help, 
but I'm in the OR right now with my team performing an emergency C-section. I know exactly where they are in the supply cabinet, but can't leave. And we're running a skeleton crew, and there's not another soul on the floor. Sorry. She hung up. Jack was stunned as he placed the phone back on its cradle and looked over at his patient. Kurt Fletcher, the head of the air flight team, spoke up. What's the story here? Are we taking this patient or not? By now, everyone on the ED team had gathered in a loose assembly outside the door. Dr. Singer looked at them as they in unison shook their heads. No catheter. He raised his hand to his face and covered his eyes, attempting to compose himself. She's yours. They moved quickly and in less than a minute had her rolling out the entrance to the waiting helicopter. The team all just stood there, most of them with their eyes downcast. Dr. Singer wanted to cry. Some of them already had tears welling up in their eyes, knowing they might have saved this patient's life if they only had a $10 piece of plastic. Okay. So, we've just heard the story of a uh, very tragic story about what had to have been, we don't know, but most likely it was a patient loss, um, all for a $10 part. That's a $10 right. $10 yeah, part that yeah. wasn't wasn't where it belonged. Um, how would you use this story um, in, a, in a continuous improvement setting or a setting where we're trying to improve patient safety? How would you apply this in a hospital setting? Well, I think the thing that you want to have happen with stories like this is you want to bring teams together to listen to the story. So the first step is to listen well. Sure. And then, uh, you know, a good debrief of this story really hinges around really one fundamental question, which actually goes back to my friend Paula Underwood, who comes from the Oneida tradition, which is, what might we learn from this story? Right. And of course you can get into more specific questions, but that question alone can lead people, if you have 10 people in the room, as we said, what's important is not necessarily the, the story itself, but it's the story that we're telling in our head. So every, every one of the 10 people in that room, they have a story, they're going to connect into that story in some way that's unique to them and they will bring that forward and now suddenly you have a group that's learning together. And they're going, oh, I, didn't, I never would have saw that, seen that, I wouldn't have sure. thought of that. Um, so that, that's a very powerful process that can awaken a group to examining and reflecting on its own practices, its own approach to safety, and its own way of asking the question, are we prepared? Right. Are we right. prepared? My gosh, do we have all of our systems in place? Have we have we checked the chargers? Could this happen here? Could this happen here? And, and then and has it yeah. happened? And even if they're not realistic. an ER, if there's some other if there's some other unit, they ask the question: What other pieces of equipment do we have that we might need in an emergency? And is it accessible and really ready? Right. Is it ready to go? Or are we going to suddenly find ourselves needing an implement of some sort and it's not there? I think one of the interesting things about using stories is that it allows people to apply their own experience. You and I have worked together in, in some situations and we've seen how people listen to a story but then they bring in 20 years of their own experience yeah. and, and they have an emotional reaction and that's where learning really starts to occur I think is when people can identify with the situation and say well luckily we don't have that kind of situation here anymore or my God, this could happen here. Yeah. I think that's And, and that's we've worked real. with hospitals where, you know, where people said, oh, this couldn't happen here, and you have four people pipe in and said, oh, yes, it could. Sure. In fact, we just had an incident in the ER, the OR, whatever, just two weeks ago where something like this happened, or we came very close. It was a near miss. We right. didn't harm the patient, but we had a near miss. So one of the things that stories can do is they can alert us and prepare us to look at those areas where we have vulnerability and risk. Exactly. And we don't have to wait till we kill a patient. So that's the beauty of story is, you know, I remember Wile E. Coyote, all of us have grown up Wile E. You know, Wiley, you know, Wiley Coyote, you know, the, he, you know he's, he's constantly chasing Roadrunner and he's constantly, you know, dying, you know. Well, we, we can, in a story, we can go there and we can make, we can see the consequences without it having, having happened to us yet. Right. Right. So we can go, gee, what do we need to do to prepare for this? Exactly. So we don't do, this wouldn't happen in our hospital, in our ER. I think two other compelling things. Um, one is the level of engagement that we've seen 
um, when people do listen to a story. Right. People yeah. want to talk about it. Once yeah. one person starts talking, yeah. then the entire group starts talking. Yeah. And we've seen some debriefs where people really became engaged. People that we didn't think were going to be engaged. That's and correct. Yeah. Voila. Yeah. Now they're talking. Yeah. And so the, dis the difference here is the difference between a story like this that's that's highly engineered with sound effects, it's engaging, and a case study. Okay, so case studies have been around forever, and people, you know, they come in, here's the case. We have a 42-year-old woman who uh, ha has a hemorrhage, and you could have distilled this down. And, uh, you know, I, I once heard someone say that a case study is like reverse alchemy, turning gold to lead. Sure. So we could we could we could pull all the story out of this and just give the facts of the case and and ask a clinical team to ask make some decisions around this. Right. What would you do? Right. And there wouldn't be the same kind of learning as the story as it was presented and people our audience just heard. It's a whole different experience. Sure. Sure. Now in my career I've done a lot of work with continuous quality improvement and another striking thing about the use of stories is that it allows you to do root cause analysis at the place where it all begins because it begins with behavior processes mm -hmm. can be overridden assets and resources can be overridden all by behavior so if we change the behavior and if we can get people into a involved in a dialogue mm -hmm. about the kinds of behaviors that could cause an instant incident like this um, then we can figure out what the root yeah. cause is, right where it begins. Yeah, and then so, we can, yeah. We can so my sense it. is what happens in hospitals today with root cause analysis is an event happens, and over a period of months and sometimes years, there's a, a you know an analysis of that, and finally someone generates a report, and it has some recommendations, and, and who knows where those go and how they finally filter into the organization. But if you do root cause analysis on the fly, using story care, for example, sure. these kinds of stories, then people can be in the process of continually learning and doing that kind of thinking, even with near misses. So we don't have to wait until we have a, a never event. Exactly. We can, we can get a team's focused on learning quickly and, and learning uh, as they go. Right, exactly. So we don't have an event like this story, and this is a true story. So, and all your stories that, uh, that you've used in, in um, story care, and I'm going to comment on story care uh, in a few minutes, um, are based on real events. Now, um, I want to ask, what's your favorite success story with the use of, of narrative, with the use of stories in a hospital setting? Well, I think my favorite one, we had a, an ER that we were working with, and the nurses in that ER, when they got, um, they got stressed and, and, and swamped, they were doing workarounds on the Pixis machine. So if you say to nurses, hey, anybody here ever done a workaround? And they're like, oh yeah, all the time. So all kinds of things were going on. They were either going and pulling drugs without actually putting any information with the intention of coming back because they were in a rush. And in the worst case, sometimes they would, they would go in and, the, and they were being forced to enter something and the patient wasn't in the system yet, so they would put it under another patient's name with the intention of coming back and fixing it, and often they did, but four to 10 times a week, they didn't. And so someone would have to go back in, and nothing the leadership would say or do seemed to get them to see the, the, the gravity of the, this problem. Sure. Uh, and luckily, they had not hurt anybody yet. You know, there, was, there had not been any kind of uh, never events because of this. So they said, can you do something to help us with this? So we created a story, and it was based on a nurse who was pulling analgesics for three patients, one of whom had an allergy to codeine. So she's in the middle of pulling the analgesics, and, and actually she had to wait for another nurse who was dutifully inputting everything into the pixel machine, and she gets a call from the front desk. They've just got four uh, victims of, of an accident had just been brought in. They need her immediately for triage. So she pulls the analgesics, runs, dispenses them and of course gives the wrong one to the patient uh. who has the allergy and uh, and so he goes into anaphylactic shock and at the end of the story he wanders into the hall and collapses they went from 10 four to ten events a week to one a month so that story had an impact on them that nothing else had had an impact and they were able to really reduce their risk in that ER from that one behavioral pattern that had sort of become you know 
it was normalized deviance, really, what we call sure, talking about. Sure. They had this had become normalized. They suddenly saw the the gravity of that and how they could they could seriously harm somebody because in the story they did, and they went there in the story emotionally and they went, oh my gosh, this 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 is dangerous what we're doing. We have to not do this. And I don't think they had gotten that. Incredible. Yeah. And there are 1.5 million injuries caused by medication errors annually in U.S. hospitals. Yeah, so yeah. that's a powerful story. Yeah, it's all about complacency. The more complacent we become, the more likely these kinds of normalized deviant deviations get built in until finally suddenly, boom, we've harmed somebody. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Well, thank you, Rick. I want to uh, just uh, say for our listening Ladies audience. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we have going to pause one moment. The of the night, <laughs> titled, When Things Go Wrong, Disclosure and Apology, in booth 711, will begin a, momentarily. We have a story for that also. And that's a there is a, nice there's a good There is a good story care story in the library about disclosure and apology. It's a very nice tie-in. So for our listening audience, if you're interested in learning more about narrative, uh, please go to www.lairdahl.com and search Story Care, yep. S-T-O-R-Y-C-A-R-E, Story Care, and you'll find all you need to know about the use of narrative and stories to improve patient safety. Rick, it's been a pleasure. Good, really me as well. Thanks for it. inviting Thank me. Very much. And I think we'll be seeing you a little later in Absolutely. the conference as well. So for, for our listening audience, tune in uh, tomorrow um, at noontime and also at 415. We'll, we will be doing more interviews and one of each of those time periods will include a story care story. Great. So Thanks thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Good. Welcome to Lairdahl's booth at the National Patient Safety Foundation Congress 2015, hosted here at the JW Marriott in Austin, Texas. We are surrounded right now by the buzz of 1,000 members of healthcare representing hospitals from across the country, members from continuous quality improvement, risk management, uh, the C suite in many hospitals. I've seen some hospital CEOs here, and uh, certainly medical directors and um, other hospital staff. So it's really great to see all these people focused on improving patient safety. We have with us um, right now a member of Sinensis, Rick Stone who is the Chief Innovation Officer for Sinensis. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the use of narratives, the use of stories in improving patient safety. Stories as a, as a means of alternative or, or a different form of simulation than what, we're, uh, the, than what we're customarily used to. Rick, thank you for being here. Good to be back. Um, I know you were here yesterday, but for those that didn't, uh, didn't view our, our presentations yesterday, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I've been working uh, with narrative and storytelling for close to 30 years now and looking at its applications both in learning and in organizations. Uh, have worked with hospitals at all levels, uh, teaching leadership how to use stories in a powerful way. And, um, and over the last few years, I've been looking at storytelling as a tool for learning that can actually propel organizations much more quickly on their journey for improvement. So it's, uh, and, and along the way I've done a few other things, written a few sure. books, uh, created a board game called Pitch a Story, and I've done a few other things in the world of entertainment around story as well. And you're a great storyteller. I've, I, I've, I've heard, told, I've heard, I've told yes, that. I've, I've heard I your stories. I'm not sure I believe um, you in it though. A couple fish stories maybe. Yeah. But, um, but we're going to talk about the use of story in, stories in improving um, patient safety and, and um, also patient satisfaction in healthcare. And in a few moments, we're actually going to listen to a story, right. and then we're going to uh, debrief. So the product that you've developed is called Story Care. And for anyone that wants to find out about Story Care, they can go to www.lairdahl.com and type in the words in the search engine, Story Care. And there you'll find um, a host of information on the benefits, but also the applications and uses of story care. I like the video that um, that you've posted on showing nurses at a nurse station debriefing a story. And uh, you and I have had a chance to do some work together, and, and we've actually had a chance to watch how um, risk managers and some, some very senior hospital staff reacted to listening to a story, and then we said, okay, could this happen here? Right. 
right. and the amount of engagement uh, that we saw in that room, people starting to really talk about their own experiences, their own feelings, that that story brought out in them was, was, was really incredible. How have you seen um, stories overcome some obstacles to well, improving yeah. patient safety? So, you know, I think Ladies yesterday we gave an example of, um, go wrong, uh, of how a, an ED uses story, to, story care seven, to actually seven, change behavior. Um, but we've actually when used it in a variety of other ways. We've used it with senior wrong, leadership, for example. I was talking with Steve Powell this morning. And uh, we were talking about transparency. So that's that's obviously a topic here at the at the Congress. Sure. Is how do we promote uh, transparency? How do we engage senior leaders to begin uh, talking in a transparent fashion? And uh, one of the things we were working with a large healthcare system in the Midwest, and we had in the room every CEO at every one of their hospitals, and we created a story about an event that actually happened in their system in which uh, a relative of one of the senior leaders died uh, totally avoidable, totally preventable, um, and use that story as a springboard for their engagement to begin asking the question, what do we want to change about the way we deal with events, never events that happen, how we deal with ourselves, and how do we deal with the, with the family members? Sure. So the story became a, an important catalyst for that conversation. Excellent. So here's what I'd like to do. What I'd like to do is actually play a story for our listening audience. Yeah. And what our listening audience is going to do is listen to this short story. I think it's going to last about four minutes. Yeah. And uh, Steve and I here in the studio, in our booth, uh, will listen to it along with you. And then we're going to debrief. Yeah. yeah. And this story that we're going to listen to, it's called A Fatal Interruption. Apropos, I think, for the, for the Congress. It's really about medication errors, which we know is a very, very big problem in healthcare. 1.5 million yes. people are injured annually yeah. in U.S. hospitals yeah. due to medication yeah. error. Yeah, so um, I think it'll be uh, a provocative story for our listeners. Excellent, let's Good. listen. Diane had been counting down the final minutes of her last shift before taking two weeks off to get married and go on her honeymoon. It had been a hectic day in the critical care unit, and she was looking forward to taking the next two weeks off from work as much as she was excited to start married life. Making a quick round with IV medications for two of her most serious ICU patients, Diane knocked on the door of Mary Swartout's room. Mary, an 83-year-old grandmother of 12, was now stable enough to move from the ICU to the step-down unit. She was still very sick and would need to stay for at least another week as her recovery continued, but she was finally making progress. Diane placed the two medication bags on the bedside table, careful to not disturb Mary, who was fast asleep. Suddenly, Diane's phone buzzed in her pocket. Instinctively, she reached for it, as if the silence ringtones might wake up her resting patient. This is Diane, she said calmly, as she muted the infusion pump's alarm before disconnecting the empty IV bag from the pole. It was Diane's sister, Beth. If Mary Swartout had been awake, she would have easily heard the sobbing on the other end of the phone as Diane's maid of honor blurted out between sobs that she had the flu and was too sick to travel. Diane stood dazed at the bedside. Her mind began to race as all the careful wedding plans they had made together came falling down to the ground. She juggled the thought of needing to call one of her other bridesmaids to fill in as maid of honor with the growing realization that her sister would not be at her wedding. Catching herself, Diane spoke loudly. Beth, I'm still here at work. I'm going to have to call you back, she said, interrupting her sister's emotional stream of apologies and list of things still needing to be handled. I'll call you as soon as I'm in the car, okay? Hanging up, Diane quickly swapped out the old medication bag with a new one and started the infusion pump. She grabbed the second medication bag and headed out of the room, tossing the old one into the medical waste container. Hearing a few emotional sniffles coming from down the hall, James looked up from the nurse's station to see Diane's misty, reddening eyes approaching as she began to fall apart. What's the matter, Diane? Are you okay? Barely able to stammer out the words, Diane replied, My sister Beth, my maid of honor, has the flu and can't make the wedding. James suddenly fathomed the gravity of the situation. He hadn't known Diane for long, but when she had shared with him her wedding plans, Beth's name was always in the mix. 
While he was also looking forward to going home after a long day, he knew his colleague was in dire need of help. Listen, you get going. I'll finish up whatever you have left and handle the shift change handover. Just be near your phone and take my call if I need to ask you something to prep the night nurse. Okay, Diane mumbled. Then composing herself, she explained how she had just replaced Mary Swartout's IV medication, but still needed to do the same for another serious patient. I'll handle it. Who's it for? Mr. Dillon in 204. Diane replied, placing the IV medication bag on the counter. After a good hug from James and a forced smile back at him, Diane collected her things and started for the elevator. Meanwhile, James scanned his vital sign monitors in the ICU nurse's station to make sure that all his patients were stable before grabbing the IV bag and heading down the hall toward Mr. Dillon's room. While Mary Swartout was on the road to recovery and most likely moving to a step-down unit in the next 24 hours, Ned Dillon was another story. He was instead in the final stages of congestive heart failure and would not be leaving the ICU. At 67 and borderline obese, he was in very serious condition and needed medication just to keep his blood pressure stable. James knocked on Mr. Dillon's door and then entered. Mr. Dillon, it's James, one of the nurses here in ICU. I have your medication. Ned Dillon was not responsive, but that had been his condition for the past several days on this slow downward slide. James walked up to the bedside to administer Mr. Dillon's medication. Suddenly, alarms began sounding in the nurse's station. Knowing that they were now short-staffed, James raced out of Mr. Dillon's room to help. Code blue, room 226. Code blue, room 226. Blasted through the overhead loudspeaker. It was Mary Swartout. Her blood pressure was rising dangerously fast. Hurriedly, James and the ICU team tried to revive Mary, but none of their efforts could stabilize her, or in the final minutes, revive her. After the resident called the time of death, James headed back to Ned Dillon's room to finish administering his IV medication. Checking the name on the new IV bag, he suddenly stopped. The name on the pharmacy label said Mary Swartout. James reached for Mr. Dillon's wrist and checked his ID band to make sure that the patient numbers were also different. They were. This was not his medication bag. It took only a moment for James to register the full weight of what had just transpired. He headed toward the nurse's station knowing that her sister's flu was going to be the least of Diane's concerns before her wedding. So absolutely, a fatal interruption. And we mentioned before, 1.5 million medication errors causing injuries annually in the United States. Um, recap the story just just briefly. Well, I think the thing that hits me about this story is, uh, one, it's obviously a tragic story on many fronts. So it's not just a tragic story for the family of, of this patient who died, but it's a tragedy for the caregiver and uh, that might probably end her career as a nurse. I don't know. Sure. Who knows what happens when, when, when caregivers are involved in, in incidents like this. Right. Um, it points out for me that um, you can't have systems where it, you can't. You have to have backup. You have to have redundancy. You have to have double checks. And especially when we're when we are in stress, we have to one be we have to be cognizant that 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 I I'm not thinking straight. We have to be situationally aware. Situationally, you know, uh, there's a wonderful team steps tool. I'm yep. safe, and uh, you know, you know, I have to say, you know what. I'm not thinking well. I need to get someone else in here, double check what I've just done, or be with me. And these are these are just some of the kinds of challenges in healthcare. But then, when you're resource stretched, you don't have enough staff. What do you do? And how do you stay how do you stay on your toes to be sure that? And we're all human, so that's also the challenge. So let me paint a picture of how this story might be used and see if you agree. Yeah. Um, I can see this story story being used to, um, first of all, have a team in a room. They listen to the story. Could this happen here? And you, or, you or and I, or has this happened here? And, and you and I have seen this firsthand, where there's silence for a little bit. Then someone has the courage to speak up. Someone says, "Yeah, it could." And here's why. And that's when the real aha moments begin, is when people start saying, here's why it could happen here. Or if there are, if have, there are measures that have already been put in place to prevent this kind of occurrence, then, then it just confirms that those measures yeah. are correct and are being followed. Yeah. But 
The aha moments are when people finally start having an honest, open dialogue. And we know right. that doesn't come from the daily memo on patient safety. No. And then the question is, what do we, we as a team do differently? What are, we, what are we going to do? If we see that we have vulnerability, that we have risk baked into the way we're operating, uh, how, can we, how can we change that? Sure. What can we begin to do to innovatively work together to have each other's back, to ensure that we are staying focused and mindful? Um, and that's, and what happens is in medication uh, delivery, that becomes such a road activity. Right. Such a road activity, and that's when we begin to let our guard down. And, and we, even if you have the right ID, it can be wrong. Maybe it came up wrong from the pharmacy. We don't sure. know. You know, do we double check what says? What does it say on the label? And and that's also another challenge. And so a story like this could really unearth whether the kinds of safety precautions are put in place, but also the training and, and also the culture that would encourage someone to disqualify him or herself because of some conditions they're operating under. Yeah, and that's a big issue is the culture, because if sure. you have a culture where it's kind of suck it up, you know, everybody's, you know, nobody everybody's complains. Everybody's working hard. Yeah. Everybody's working hard. Hey, don't, don't come here and tell me you're tired. Um, you have a culture that is actually promulgating the probability you're going to harm somebody. Right. So if you have a culture where you have a team leader on that unit who's always looking out for all of her or his staff members and hey guys just remember if you're getting tired come to me then we have an opportunity to do something different now i remember one moment um and and i think it was one of the most powerful moments i've experienced in um working with story care and using the the, the power of stories to to get those aha moments for people um, was when uh, we were together and uh, the story was about communications. The, the, the story involved a nurse who just did not feel comfortable communicating to a doctor that the doctor in this case had in fact made a medication error and uh, the chief medical officer in the room leaned back and said to everybody in the room, I remember him making eye contact and saying, our doctors need to know how they're perceived and this story tells it all. I remember that, and um, it, was, it was just, uh, as I say, a real aha moment. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that is the story, stories are sneaky. So if you went to all the doctors and said, you guys don't, you know, you're not, you don't know how you're perceived, their defenses are gonna be up. Sure. They hear a story about another incident, and they're able to see that and reflect on it, and it's really about other people, sort of. There is a softening of the defenses and a willingness to start to do some self-reflection and, um, and be able to be honest about, you know, dude, that's me. That could be me. I've done that. And I see now the implications of what my behavior is for, for my team here. Right. Yeah. And I think this afternoon, um, for those that want to join us at uh, approximately, I believe, 420, we'll have you on this yeah. afternoon. We're going to talk about a different story, a story involving communications, and in this case, communications going up, and we're going to have the chance to experience how um, a nurse is perceived in giving her information um, to a doctor, and it uncovers, in this case, the need for the Team Steps tool, SBAR. Right. So we'll be talking about that this afternoon. Good. For those of you in the listening audience that would like to learn more about Story Care, once again, please go to Lairdahl.com and search Story Care. Rick Stone, thank you much for uh, for joining us this Good. afternoon. We'll Enjoy see you later it. in the see day. See you later. Thanks a lot, Andrew. And uh, we'll ask our listening audience to uh, just peep. please pause for a few moments while we tee up our next guest. Thank you very much. Welcome back to our viewers as we broadcast live from the National Patient Safety Foundation Congress 2015 at the JW Marriott in Austin, Texas. We uh, have again our guest who's been kind enough to join us a few times now at our booth. Rick's You're going to have to start paying me, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm on a flight at an undisclosed time uh, later this evening. Just want to let you know. Yeah. Um, so Rick uh, Stone is the Chief Innovation Officer for Sinensis, and he's back to talk to us more about the use of narrative, the use of stories in improving patient safety, patient outcomes, um, patient care quality, and patient satisfaction. 
So you wanted to talk a little bit about reflective learning, right? Well, yeah, so you know, in, in our conversations here about the power of story and how do you push organizational change, how, do you, how does that happen? Um, there, there's a couple very interesting things about, about story. First of all, every organization is filled with stories. So every, any, in healthcare especially, Often, though, people who are in healthcare because they're so busy and engaged with their work, if you said, "Do you have any good stories?" They might go, oh, "I don't know," you know, because they're just in the stream of their workflow. But if you get them to stop and, and think and, and reflect, they often have very powerful tales to tell. Okay. And so, uh, and actually, there's a poster session that I just saw here. It was about getting uh, staff to begin telling their stories as a way of engaging other staff. So, um, so storytelling is a very powerful methodology for connecting people to what matters. And uh, Carl Weick uh, has written a wonderful little book uh, about sense making in organizations. And he, he makes a very interesting point. He says that what happened yesterday doesn't exist any longer. It's gone. It only exists in our memory in the way we represent it in the narratives and tales that we tell. Let me tell you about something that happened yesterday with a patient, or let me tell you something that happened with one of my fellow workers, or let me help tell you about something that was really challenging for me and how we dealt with that. Um, so that is the wealth of knowledge that is, that, it's, that is sitting in an organization. And the question is, how do you tap into that? People are learning all the time, but if you don't, create space and time for people to reflect on their practice. There is no chance to harvest the learning and perhaps make a course correction, either personally or as a team. Because people tend to go on automatic pilot and they march along until someone says, wait a second, this, this looks like familiar territory. We've been here before and we don't like this forest. Right, right, this right. Is a, this is a dark place to be in, you know, and it's dangerous. and. And, and didn't, didn't we make the same mistake just six weeks ago? And did we make any changes? No, we're still going about it the same way because we didn't stop to reflect and to think. So, uh, so the, the important the power of stories are powerful, but they're only powerful when they are coupled with reflection. And we call that debriefing and simulation, sure. but essentially it is a reflective practice and a reflective process. And, um, and it's sorely missing for most sectors of our lives. We personally don't take time to reflect often. It's only maybe as we get older and we've got a little time to sit back in the rocking chair and go, what was that all about? You know, the last 60 years or whatever it was. Um, and, but organizations have to create reflective spaces as well. And, and they can do it in lots of ways. Uh, Story care is just one way to do that. But it, and it's a structured way of doing that. But there are lots of other ways the organizations can create a space for people to tell their stories. And so I think one of the power links about these stories is sometimes, as I think I said in our first interview, it's not necessarily the story itself, although there is great value in it. It's what it elicits from other people who are sure. listening to the story, the stories that it brings out in them, which are the connecting points from a knowledge perspective. Right, of course. And uh, so you mentioned two things. First of all, I want to um, I, I want to come back to the topic of engagement. But first, you mentioned story care. So um, I'd like to just explain to our listeners what story care is. Uh, story care is um, your your product, your child, um, your yeah. your innovation. And story care is a library of stories based on real um, events in hospitals, real healthcare events where what one does is one listens to a story and then debriefs afterwards, but they're not so much debriefing to the, certainly the facts of the story they're debriefing to, but they're debriefing to how those facts speak to them and, and, and their own experience in the context of their world. And we've right. listened to a few stories already over the course of, of the Congress now, um, and we know, because I've, I've worked with you, we've seen how people will take facts from a story and now their heart's engaged. Not just their mind, but their heart as well. And they start to think about their own experiences and they start to think about how, well, maybe I need to change this 
behavior in myself or maybe as an organization we need to change certain behaviors so the kinds of things that happened in this story don't happen on my watch. Yeah, and I think for change to happen we, we often underestimate the importance of the heart being engaged. Right. We have to be moved. And it's when we are emotionally moved and we're open that we can entertain a possibility. And too often, I think leaders try to map behaviors onto people as though they were mapping on a, a new jacket. Sure. I want you to put this new jacket on. And that pay, the, the staff will really quickly jettison that jacket because it's not the right color, I don't like it. But if we engage their heart, then they could go, I need, think I need to be wearing a different jacket. This jacket that I've been wearing all this time doesn't, doesn't fit anymore. So it's we not should, appropriate. We should talk for a moment um, about engagement because we've seen um, how um, in an audience of, for example, um, you and I just recently worked together at a presentation that involved risk managers, uh, a chief medical uh, director, and uh, a host of others. And to see them get engaged at their level uh, regarding a story was incredible. And I was thinking to myself, would I rather learn from a PowerPoint or would I rather learn from a story? <laughs> yeah, PowerPoint well, story. Yeah, it's a tough uh, conundrum, but uh, yeah, and, and you know, I, PowerPoint is maybe unfortunately one of the worst things that ever happened to corporate America. I, you know, you know, with, with Microsoft, evil for it, all of us, I don't yeah. know, and it's you know, and com companies say, well, you don't come make a presentation. Where's your slides? You know, sure. So I mean, but the best PowerPoint slides presentation you ever seen are the ones where someone came with very few slides or a couple of pictures and told and, a story. And they told stories, <laughs> right? So I, you know, right. I'm constantly having to harp on that. But yes, yeah, so yeah, and, and and the way you the way learning often happens or attempts to is attempted in organizations. We sent out a memo. We sent right. out a. Uh, a set of, uh, of best practices, um, and we know those don't work very well. Of course. Because uh, they, uh, uh, they're not my practices. There's some practices that might have worked over at Hospital XYZ, but they're not like my hospital. And usually those practices evolved organically from the teams, and it came out of their life experience working with patients. Right. And so the ideal thing is, is I think if you unleash the power of your teams at the front line, they will innovate and generate their own best practices. And they may be exactly the same as that we're over here, but they own them. Right. Yeah, you know, they own them. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that, that's a lot about whether something actually sticks. And, and exactly. And that's what it's all about, is yeah. making the message stick. So would you like to listen to a story? Yeah, yeah I think we have another one queued up. So we so. have a story yeah. queued up. So what we're going to ask our um, our listeners is to listen to the following story. Rick Stone and I will listen to it with you and then we will uh, debrief. After, yeah, this after story is entitled, How Could This Happen? It's, uh, just to give you just a quick, uh, it's, sure. about, it's about a mom who is uh, expecting. Uh, it had medical in, uh, difficulties in her first birth of her first child and um, is attempting to avoid those same complications in this birth. Right. And we'll see what happens. Sure. Good. So why don't we listen, to the, listen story. to the story? John and Jessica Campbell were having their second baby. During Jessica's first pregnancy, she struggled with being a borderline gestational diabetic. It was a nightmare, as she described it to her new OBGYN, Dr. Jennifer Davenport. Dr. Davenport looked down at Jessica's records. Eight pound, five ounce baby boy, delivered at 40 weeks. I see here that you had a third degree tear after an episiotomy and that it had partially broken down, requiring quite a few postpartum visits to clean the wound. That must have been really painful. Jessica rolled her eyes and nodded. I don't want to ever go through that again. Understandably, let's take a look. Dr. Davenport inspected the site. Your perineum appears to have healed well. Have you had any problems with bowel movements or passing gas when you don't want to? Jessica was emphatic. Thank God, no. Well, we could do a C-section, but that has potential complications. Jessica didn't much like that idea. Dr. Davenport was reassuring, though. We'll do whatever we can to prevent a serious tear this time around. I promise you. Finally, the big day came. When Jessica got to the triage area, she was already six centimeters. Unfortunately, Dr. Davenport was not on call and wasn't even in town. She had gone to see her mother, who was having health problems four hours away. 
Dr. Diane Travers, one of her partners, was covering for her. Dr. Travers introduced herself once Jessica got to her room, explaining Dr. Davenport's absence. Did you have any prenatal problems, Jessica? No. Oh, oh, Jessica replied as another contraction came on. Dr. Travers' calm demeanor seemed infectious and she relaxed. I'll be right back. You're doing really well. At the nurse's station, she directed Susan Fiedler to break Jessica's bag of water. I'd like to get her going, because there's a high-risk patient coming in in about an hour. Susan wondered whether this was a wise thing to do, but didn't say anything. In a matter-of-fact tone, she informed Jessica that they were going to break her water. Jessica didn't even question why. The flu was clear, and Susan reported that fact to Dr. Travers when she came out of another patient's room. When Dr. Travers reviewed Jessica's prenatal chart, she was pleased. The fetal heart tones were perfect, category one. Jessica moved rapidly in labor and in 20 minutes was complete and a plus three station. There simply wasn't time for an epidural and besides, anesthesia was busy that night. After another wave of contractions, Jessica blurted out to her husband, I can't believe I didn't get my epidural. Why didn't anyone even talk to me about it? Dr. Travis returned to the room as the head was crowning. Jessica was in serious pain. Isn't there something we can give her, her husband asked. Shaking her head, Dr. Travers was emphatic. Not now. She's moving too quick. The best thing is to get that baby out. Quickly, the nurse and doctor prepped and draped. Jessica let out a loud, as Dr. Travers calmly delivered the baby. It was a seven-pound girl with an APGAR score of 10. All seemed fine as Jessica slumped back in bed tired, but exhilarated with her new child in her arms. But when Dr. Travers examined the perineum, there was a third-degree tear right along the obvious scar of the previous tear. She repaired it. Jessica, you're going to have to take good care of that bottom with sitz baths and stool softeners. Unfortunately, you tore into your anal sphincter. Not again, Jessica cried. Dr. Travers was surprised. I didn't know this happened before. You didn't say anything when we talked earlier. I had a problem with the tear healing the first time around. I told Dr. Davenport, and she promised me she'd do everything possible to prevent it happening again. All Dr. Travers could muster in response was, hmm. The next day, Dr. Gonzalez, another colleague in the practice, saw Jessica for her first postpartum visit. Any problems with your delivery? Well, I tore again, Jessica said. Dr. Gonzalez checked the repair. It's healing well. Just keep the area clean, eat your fiber, and take that colase, okay? Jessica nodded, feeling a bit discouraged and defeated. Can I be discharged today? Dr. Gonzalez nodded. Sure, but let's see you in two weeks. Unfortunately, Jessica's tear didn't heal well. The scar tissue wasn't as healthy as the previous normal tissue, and another breakdown occurred, this time taking four weeks to heal and requiring visits from the home health nurse. When Jessica came in for her six-week appointment, she was furious with Dr. Davenport. How did you let this happen to me? was her only question. Dr. Davenport stared back at her like a deer caught in the headlights. That's pretty powerful. So Yeah, so you know, I, you know, if a clinical team is listening to this story, I mean, there's really a lot of interesting junctures along the way where you'd say, how did this happen? And how did, you know, and a, a nurse, uh, had a question but didn't say it didn't speak up and the, the handoff from Dr. Davenport had you know there was inadequate knowledge that was passed on uh, if, if the team had really been prepped properly this wouldn't have happened again and now you, you know we haven't we haven't killed the patient but we have really created a great deal of harm and uh, that will affect her probably maybe for a long time sure I think what's interesting um, in, in how people respond and embrace a story is they come at it exactly the way you just did. They talk about the story and they start to analyze and assess what the other team did. And then it's very easy to, to then turn that back into, okay. What about so us? What about us? Yeah. yeah. What about us? Yeah. And that type of engagement is priceless. Yeah. It's, it's something you can't get from a memo. Yeah, that's right. um, you're not going to get that kind of engagement, inspiration. And I think also, uh, we talked a little bit in, in one of our previous interviews about root cause analysis. Now you're engaging the people that are on the front lines of root cause. 
That's right. You're going beyond statistics, beyond processes. Um, you're going beyond the data analysis, and you're looking at human behavior, which really, at the, yeah. the end of the day, is is the owner of the root cause. Yeah, and, and you often say, bring up, Andrew, is that in some ways the power of these stories is around decision making. Sure. Is that helping people look about the look at the decisions they have been making and asking the question, should we make a different kind of decision given our situations here? It wouldn't have taken a lot to have adjusted the course of the trajectory of that story. And it wouldn't take a lot to, to adjust the trajectory of many patients' healing journey. Sure. Um, it's little things, but they're little decisions that get made or not made that impact that profoundly. And, and what an efficient, um, both cost efficient, but also process efficient way to allow people to train to make those kinds of decisions. Um, story care is something that can be brought to people 24-7. That's over, right. over over the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for yeah. our viewers, uh, we were actually listening to the story and reading the story on uh, Rick's iPhone here while you were all listening to it on the air. So this can be delivered by yeah. uh, PC, yeah. by yeah. iPhone, iPhone. Yeah. iPad. iPad. So a team can gather around the nurse. What we what we really like this is that they don't have to leave their place of work to go to a, find a video, a, a, you know, a, a, a screen or whatever, because it's all audio. Sure. And it's using the power of the imagination. So we think that's a very powerful simulator. So they can do it at the nurse's station in and in a quick huddle. Um, and it's not just for clinical teams. It's also for non-clinical teams. Exactly. So, you know, we know that simulation's powerful. There's a, there's a simulation going on right behind us right now. And, and your company knows the power of simulation. How difficult is it, though, to get people from from their place of work down to the sim lab? If they, if your hospital even has a sim lab, sure. So the power of this is an intermediate solution: is that you can get teams thinking and reflecting on 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 a very powerful theme without taking them away from or having to go f uh, schedule everybody, which sometimes is a very challenging thing in a hospital. Anybody who touches a patient can be introduced yeah, yeah, to and a doesn't story. Have to, and it doesn't have to be a clinical uh, staff. Exactly. It's also non-clinical staff. Exactly. Well, Rick, thank you very much. We've run out of time. Good. Um, but this has, been, um, this has been fantastic. We so much appreciate all the time that you've spent with us. Uh, for those of you who are interested in learning about story care, you can go to www.lairdahl.com and type in in the search uh, search bar story care you can also google story care and you should be able to find it that way rick stone thank you very much for joining us thanks andrew for those of us view for those of you viewing if you would please uh, stand by in just a few moments we will have our next guest from the national patient safety foundation congress 2015. thank you